Sometimes in life we can be a little bit confused and what we simply need is a little clarity. Isn't that true? Well, today we're beginning a six-week series about bringing some clarity to who we are, what we're called to be, what do we do here? Because sometimes it really takes a moment to readdress your purpose as spiritual beings. Why do we come together and why do we call this place City of Light and why do we even get up on Sunday morning and why do we even gather together as a community? Could we not just sleep in, stay home, you know, just enjoy the wonderful presence of God with that pillow snuggled all up and uh, curled up in our beds? Well, here's the reason. We're going to look at this over the next six weeks to bring clarity. Last year, our board of directors gathered together and we said, this is our year to be very clear. We said we need to be very clear about who we are, what we're doing, because that clarity will help us as, and help to define us and give us a, a pure sense of direction. So it is, we began to form a defining statement. And we've been reading that statement as we begin our Sunday services for now uh, almost over a year and sharing this wonderful truth of who we are, what we hope to be, what we want to accomplish, how we act. It answers so many questions in that. So this series is going to break that down and help us to greater clarity of understanding. City of light, who are we? People of God, who are we? What's our purpose? What are we here to do? Let's get some clarity around it as we begin this journey together. Because what's important is that we have a clear-cut vision, a clear-cut understanding it will help us understand even more who we are and where we came from. Fortunately, I'm going to tell you, we all came from the wonderful grace of God. So if you're confused about that, don't let me tell you any other story, okay? <laughs> so what we want to begin with is that opening statement that we read here. It says this. you find it on our screen. We start with this sentence that says, This is a place where people of like mind come together to recognize in Christ consciousness that there truly is only one power ever present and all knowing. Wow, sometimes it's a lot of words, it's a lot of things to comprehend. And certainly on Sunday mornings when you just came up, woke up, and you were sat down in your seat, and suddenly we're asking you to come on, stand up and say this together, and you're like, all right, whatever, okay. I'm kind of like, you know, yeah, this is a place, uh huh. And sometimes we have to stop and say, what are we saying? Well, let's break that down because truly this is a place. This is a place where, but it's more than just a location that we're talking about. This is a place, a place in our hearts that we've come to. When we say this is a place, it's not just a building or a structure. It's not just this is the only place where we encounter God. It's not this is the place when we say that it's not just a, a 3125 presidential parkway. What we're talking about is a place that we've come into our hearts. This is a place where, and how important we understand this because what we're doing is more than just gathering in a building. We're creating sacred space. That's right. This is sacred space. And this can be sacred space anywhere because over my 41 years of pastoral ministry, I've had sacred space appear in, on form uh, in so many different contexts. In Kenya, we gathered under the biggest tree we could find for shade. And it was sacred space. And we had church. In Tanzania, we would gather in a dung uh, elephant dung, mud hut, yes, uh, fortunately the dung had dried, and uh, so it would be our shelter with a thatched roof, and we would find that to be sacred space. My work in the Bahamas, we would gather out on the beach in sandy white uh, sands of the ocean, waves slapping up against them, and that was sacred space. There were times that we would gather together uh, in great temples and cathedrals in my years of ministry in Europe and had chances to really experience sacred space. And then as a child, uh, my father and mother were pastors and we pastored and lived in a simple schoolhouse turned into a church that was sacred space. And then we're here at 3125 Presidential Parkway. This is sacred space. We create sacred space together. We create this wonderful awareness and consciousness that right here now, this moment is a sacred moment. This moment is filled with power and presence. This now, right now, is so filled with the divine essence of God as we become simply aware. We create this wonderful dynamic of a space that's filled with the power and presence of God where the miraculous can happen. 
That sacred space is where you are. It is that holy ground that you stand on. And we can create that anywhere. We could leave this room and still have sacred space. We could go upstairs and have sacred space. We can go outside the parking lot in sacred space because sacred space is created right where you are. And this is a place. It's a place in your heart. We come together first and foremost, acknowledging that we come together in a sacredness, realizing it's within. It doesn't matter what the room is like. It doesn't matter if it's a cathedral, if it doesn't matter if it's a schoolhouse, it doesn't matter if it's a beach or under a tree, it doesn't matter if it's a mud hut, it doesn't matter because it, what matters is what we're creating within, in this space within our hearts and our lives. There's a beautiful example for us in the Old Testament in the story of Moses out in the desert. He had run from his upbringing, from his home, from his family setting in Egypt in the Pharaoh's palace. He had fled that space feeling in fear for what he had done, for he had realized he was a Hebrew living in the Egyptian palace. And there in support of the Hebrew, he had killed an Egyptian who were in defense and said, ah, I've got to run. I've got to get out of town. I've got to get out of Dodge right here and now. And flees out to the desert. And there in the desert, he begins a new life. And thinking, I could just run away from everything from my past and everything I've done. I'm scared. I'm frightened. I'm all these kind of things. I, I may be a little even insecure about who I am. And then he encounters this burning bush. And the voice speaks to him and says, take off your sandals. Take off your sandals. Take off your sandals and put those toes in the desert ground. Why is this so crucial that we in our own life understand that being uh, connected in sacred space may require us to slip off our shoes, our sandals. I'm not talking in a literal context because I'm not advocating a barefoot Sunday service. Although if you want to come that way, it's fine too. If you want to come in sandals and boots or shoes or whatever, we're not asking you to take them off. Might be a good thing you keep them on because sometimes it's a little bit uh, uncomfortable. It's about slipping off any barrier. It was a wonderful symbol and metaphor for us in the teaching of the lesson that what's most important is to remove those things that would keep you from being aware that you are grounded in holy space, that where you stand right now is sacred, that this very moment, right where your feet are, is sacred space. Stand with me right now, would you? Stand up and acknowledge right now. Put your feet on the ground. Tap those feet on the ground for a minute. This is sacred space that you're standing on. That's right. Right now, in this moment, you can be seated. You did a great job. Give yourself a round of applause. All right. You follow directions nicely. You see, it's an acknowledgement that this is holy ground that you're in. Because in that moment of removing all barriers, removing those things, obstacles that would see, remove us from the connection. You know how it is? That, you know, it's wonderful in the summertime after the lawn has been mown to slip off your shoes and run through the grass barefoot, isn't it? It's not a great childhood memory. I have those. Is it wonderful to go to the beach? And it's no fun to dangle your toes in with your shoes on. It's more fun to tip your toes in the water there. You sense it. You have a better connection. You see what I'm saying? How important it is that we remove these barriers spiritually within our lives so we have the best connection with the holy sacred space that you're in right now, the best connection with this moment, this right now, this experience that you remove. What do I need to take off? Let's take off some shoes. Let's take off this. Let's take off that. Don't take off too much. But take off something that says simply, I just want to be in full connection with this holy space that I'm in right now. This is a place where... All kinds of things can unfold for us. We say this every Sunday, and it begins right within our heart. Moses, then in this moment of taking off his shoes, has this wonderful understanding that this is my moment of my wholeness. This is my moment of my completeness. This is my moment of my perfection. I realize who I am because I have taken or shed all the other things that could be obstacles or barriers between me and this connection. And I realize I'm a frightened Moses. I'm a scared Moses. I'm feeling insecure Moses. I'm feeling like I'm not perfect Moses. I'm feeling all these kind of things. And then when I begin to shed those things, I realize, wait a minute, in God, 
I am perfect. In God, I am whole. In God, I am empowered to be something amazing. I realize that. There's a beautiful text in the scriptures that says, beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. I had trouble with that one because I could look down and say, mm, I don't know. I've been a preacher for 41 years, and I can tell you these feet ain't pretty. Mm -mm. But that's not what it means. It's not a literal context. It means beautiful are the feet of those who are grounded in the sacred knowing that right here, now, this moment, every single moment, every now is sacred as filled with the power and presence of the divine. That no matter where you go, every foot you put down that touches ground, beautiful are those feet that are grounded in this awareness, grounded in this truth, that have removed all barriers. So we begin by creating this sacred space through recognizing, through recognizing how important it is. For we say creation, that we're going to create something that really, let me tell you this, there's nothing new under the sun, says Solomon in the Old Testament. And how true that is. For God has created everything. Our creation is creating awareness. For that which is sacred space, we're not creating sacred space in the sense that it doesn't exist. It's already existing. But what we have to create is the awareness of the sacred space. Because it's already here. Sacred space has always been with you. It goes with you, never leaves you, nor forsakes you. That's the presence of God. It's sacred space in the shower. It's sacred space in your bed. It's sacred space in your kitchen. It's sacred space out in your garden. It's sacred space on the patio. It's sacred space in the bar where you were last night with too many cocktails. Oh, no, I, did, I didn't see that. Uh, it's sacred space wherever you are. That's what I'm saying to you is that you can't shake off that space. And we're not creating it. We're creating awareness of it and how important it is. Because we sang this morning, what? God? Is already here. Can't you feel the presence already here? All you got to do is open up your heart for God is already here. So what, we're not creating. We're not whipping something up. We're not shaking a bunch of tambourines, doing all the ghost dance, trying to get something to go. Come on, get the spirit here. We're, we're not calling God. God, come down. God, come down. Where are you, God? Come on. We don't. And people say, well, I didn't feel God. I didn't feel God in the room. I didn't feel God in the presence. All you got to do is open up your heart for God is already here. We sang it. Did you know what you're saying? You just profess something wonderful that says, I'm in sacred space. This is a place where sacred space is happening. This is a place within my life where sacred space is unfolding. I'm ripping off some sandals. I'm taking off some shoes. I'm digging my toes into holy ground. And I'm feeling, ooh, I'm in a divine space. I'm in a place that is all good. So we begin to recognize. Now, how is it we recognize? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking, because let me tell you this. This is how we recognize. We say it every Sunday. We recognize in Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness. It's an awareness of that which is our, uh, our relationship with the divine, that we are sons and daughters. That Christ awareness, a consciousness that Christ had, that Jesus had. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let this consciousness, this awareness be in you. So what happens is in Christ consciousness, something transforms us. It's a transformational awareness. It's an awareness that changes us. It's an awareness that transforms our life. When I was a 17-year-old driver just getting my driver's license, thinking I was so cool, you know, taking dad's car, going out for a spin, going to pick up all my friends. We were going to go downtown and we were going to do Chinese fire drills. Do you all remember Chinese fire drills where you stop the car and everybody gets out and runs around? We thought we were so cool. Oh, yes. I can remember those good old days. So I take in the keys and I'm driving down the road. I'm heading down Lafayette Road. I remember to this day, cruising along and all of a sudden here comes red lights flashing behind me. And I knew enough, I guess I got to pull over. And the policeman just kind of smiled at me as a young driver and knowing, knowing that I was the pastor's son. Uh, the, he just kind of took, 
took me aside and said, you know, Paul, I got to tell you this. The speed limit said 45. I think you were going a little bit more than 45. Hmm. I guess I hadn't seen the sign. I wasn't really aware. So I'll tell you what, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a warning now that you're aware. I said, oh, I'm aware. It's transformational. Yes. Uh -huh. Trust me, officer. Now that I'm aware, I am transformed. I'm a new driver. I will go. 25 miles looks really good in this space. I know it. Thank you for that warning. I'm transformed. You see, this is what we want to have is an awareness of the Christ consciousness is an awakening, an aha, an awareness that's transformational. It says, now that I get it, I'm changed. There's a lot of people who know that there's a cell phone law in the state of Georgia that you cannot drive and hold the cell phone. I don't know that people are aware because we drive down the road. We see everybody on their phone driving along, talking on their phone, still there. And so there's no transformation because maybe they've got to have that little experience with the red flashing lights in their background. You see, what happens is we know, we know, we know, but we're not transformed. A Christ consciousness is, I get it. I'm aware. And I'm transformed by it. I'm changed. I'm different because I'm fully conscious, fully aware of what this means in my life. It is being so aware of the spirit of the divine within us, being so aware that God dwells within us, not outside of us, being so aware that there's a self-realization. I love that word. Let's break it down. Self-realization. We say self-realization all the time. We say self-realization, but we know what we're saying. We're saying a self-awareness of the real I. The real me. Oh, I love to tell the truth. How many watch that television show? It's uh, being uh, reproduced in a new context where they ask, will the real person please stand up? Will the real uh, person who has been described by these uh, three uh, people who are trying to say project themselves as being a particular person who has a skill or set or something about them, they're a lion trainer or they're the first one to swim, swim the English Channel or whatever it may be. And everybody's professing to be it, but they want to know who's the real one. Who's living in illusion? Who's the fantasy? Who's not really real, but who is real? And in our journey of our life, we want to come to this moment of self-real I. Not fake I. Not phony I. Not pretending to be I. Not confused I. The real I. You see, this is where we come in Christ consciousness. Says, I know that I know who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm divine. I'm divinely created. And the spirit of God dwells in me, through me, around me, and always for me. For that's my real I. Now, the fake I, the illusion I, the crazy one is the, the I that's out there that's the negative I. That the world is trying to impart upon us and say, you're not that great. You're not that fabulous. You'll never be anything. Why are you trying? You're a loser, you know? <laughs> the, the world is just a, a terrible place. We know that's not the real I. Because why? God don't make junk. I'm going to tell you that. God don't make junk. You are created in the divine image. There is perfection within you. It's inside you. Wake into the real self, real I. That no matter what the world may say, no matter what your parents say, no matter what your teachers said, no matter what your friends said, no matter what your enemies have said, no matter what anyone else has said or tried to convey to you, you know the real person within you and you've discovered this. Now, when we all embrace this, what happens is there's a common awareness. Suddenly we start moving in like mindedness. Now, you've self realized. You've self-realized. You're self-realizing. You're self-realizing. Wait a minute. Everyone in here is realizing. Wait a minute. We're children of God. Let's say it together. We are children of God. We are children of God. Let's personalize it. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Whoa. Do you realize we just came into like-mindedness? We just all agreed. Can you believe that? Scripture says where two or three are gathered and it come together in agreement. Uh, where two or three are gathered together in agreement, this is not Congress. 
Uh, no, that's not what it says. Scripture says, where two or three are gathered together in my presence, I'm there. That's the whole message. But we understand that there's agreement, there's like consciousness, there's commonality of thought. There's a, a full awareness that you're aware, you're aware, you're aware, you're aware, you're aware. We're all aware together. Wow, what an electric environment we create. That sacred space within my heart matches the sacred space within your heart. And it's just elevating the vibrational frequency of the divine awareness within this room. And before you know it, it starts lifting and lifting and lifting and accelerating and getting better and better and better and better because we're in awareness and we're like-minded in agreement with that together. First Peter 3.8 says this passage. Finally, finally, be you all like-minded. Finally, meaning, now, what's most important? Like, you could do all this other stuff, but let me sum it all up. Finally, let me tell you too. Here's what you really need. Above all things, if you're really working on a list of things to do, you can say, we're going to be great, we're going to be kind, we're going to, but finally, most important is, be like-minded. Being like-minded, you can try all sorts of things, but when you realize, finally, the amazing things that will unfold in your life when we all come into a like-mindedness. And what is like-mindedness? That's when everyone thinks like I think. Oh, no. Here I thought I could have you say amen. Oh, no. I thought there would be agreement here. But we like to think that way, don't we? Oh, real like-mindedness is when you think like I think. Uh huh. When you vote like I think. When your politics are like my thing. When everything, you know, you're, you like the same food that I like then we're in like-mindedness. Like-mindedness is not about the individual mind. It's a like-mindedness where we all come together in the God mind, the divine mind, that which is God, the infinite wisdom. So we become in this wonderful spirit, in this like-mindedness where we say, I leave my self-focused thought and mind, and I welcome the mind of God. And you're in the mind of God. You're in the mind of God. You're thinking like the mind of God. And you're acting and you're living and you're becoming in this sense of agreement with one another, this like-mindedness, which is an incredible energy that's so beautiful and powerful within us that we become a one mind. Because that one mind, that mind of God, you're all part of, and that mind of God is love. Love. So when we begin to unite, now we may say, you know, I like fish. I'm vegan. I don't eat meat. I don't eat vegetables. I don't like this. I don't like that. It's too hot in this room. It's too cold in this room. It's too dark in this room. There's too much light. There's too much to look at. I don't like the color in the restroom. I love the color in the restroom. Wow, how do we all get together? We come into agreement as we move into the mind of God, that love. First and foremost, I think from love. I think from love. And when you think from love, and I think from love, and you think from love, we're coming together. It's such a sense of oneness that happens within our lives that we become so transformed in this group, in this dynamic, in this room. We create an energy that's moving on that's so different because we become of one accord. Where have we heard that passage before? One accord? Well, it's in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 speaks of the very birth of the spiritual movement of what we may call the church. The spiritual movement began as people began to tarry together. Now Jesus had departed, told the disciples, wait, there's a power that's coming to you. Tarry in Jerusalem. Wait in Jerusalem. So they gathered together in this upper room. All these different people gathering together in the upper room with their own ideas and their own ways and their own thoughts and their own experiences coming together. But suddenly, as they began to pray, meditate, center their hearts, move into a one mind, a like-mindedness, move and operate from the spirit of love, first and foremost, suddenly the scripture says, and they were in one accord. They were in unity. They were in harmony. They were in harmony with one another. They resonated well with one another. There was this wonderful spirit of common agreement. It doesn't mean that everybody just compromised their values and said, you know, I'm mad at this and I'm mad at that and I'll just find a way to... Everybody moved to love. Isn't it funny? We find a lot of commonality in love. 
if we thought every day from the spirit of love. All that diversity that we have in the world and all of our differences that we want to point out and all of our uniqueness, it melts together in the common thought of love. Love unites us and brings us together. And so we find that this early church, a great miraculous movement happened. It happened that they were so filled with this divine presence, a like-mindedness, a one-mindedness, that they were in one accord. And they moved out from that room and they went out into the celebration called Pentecost that was happening in the city. There were people there from all different backgrounds. And they began to speak. And people of other tongues and other languages and other uh, cultures began to understand what they were saying. Now, how was that happening? Was there a translator there? And as Ursula is speaking in French, someone is translating into German. And as Carla is speaking in Spanish, someone's translating into Chinese. And someone's speaking in Japanese. No. What was the translator? It was love. It was the like-mindedness the oneness, because we all begin to understand, though we may come from different language backgrounds, different cultures, we begin to understand a message of love. Oh, and when you speak love, you don't even need words because you comprehend. Oh, my dog speaks a language of love. He comes at me in the morning, tail wagging, that beautiful uh, sparkle in his eyes, plating his face on the bed, swagging and saying, looking at me and staring at me, and I just know... He loves me. I heard him say it. Oh, my dog doesn't speak, but he speaks oh so well. The language of love unites us and brings us together. I want to tell you this, that as we understand this, we will know that uh, we will see what we're prepared to see. So on those day of Pentecost, when everybody's in like-mindedness, they were prepared to see the miraculous unfold. And when we all come into like-mindedness, as we say that we do every Sunday, as we declare, as we proclaim, as we speak it out, what happens is we're getting ready to see what we're prepared to see. But we got to be prepared to see it, for us to see it. Does that make sense? So you see what you're prepared to see. So here it is as we gather together in this church we, in this Sunday experience, what happens for us at City of Light as we come together in one mind and we prepare ourselves to see the divine at work, to see God being experienced, to feel and the presence of the divine from one another, that the God in me sees the God in you, and the God in you sees the God in me, and the grace in me sees the grace in you, and the love in you sees the love in me, and the love in me sees it, and it goes on and on it goes. And that's the experience because we're prepared to see. And suddenly we begin to see amazing things that we didn't really see prior. We begin to see that God is omnipresent. Omnipresent, meaning always present. We begin to see that. We realize, wait a minute, there's not a spot where God's not. God's always present with us. We understand that because I think, wait a minute, God was with me in my devotions out on the patio. And I left the patio and Dang, Nevin, I think God followed me. You know, I was driving down the road and I was praying along for Sunday morning. And the presence of God was with me in the car. I'm like, dang, I think the presence of God's in the car with me. And I got out of the car and I walk into the church and I'm like, wow, I see you. And I said, wow, the presence of God is here. It's ever present, omnipresent. Oh, I get it. And we begin to see that. Suddenly we were prepared to see that in this space, Within our hearts, this sacred place, we see the world differently. And we begin to see then that God is omnipotent and all-powerful. And we begin to see the power of God working in you and you and you. And we begin to hear the stories of how the power of God worked in your life, opening the doors for a job, or how the power of God worked in your life in healing, or how the power of God touched you, or how the power of God directed you, giving guidance. But you realize that there is a one power and everything else is the absence of power unless we give it power. You know, darkness exists, but when the lights go on, there's no more darkness, right? Unless, of course, you start shutting the lights off and you start giving power to the darkness. Goodness is the one power. God is the one power and ever-present. 
But it's only when we stop recognizing the one power and we start giving our power away and giving power to evil, that evil begins to rise. Evil begins to flourish because you're giving it power. You're feeding it power. That drama, that gossip, you know, it dies if you don't give it power. Oh, but you give it power. Hello, Sarah, did I tell you this? Oh, Martha, did I tell you that? Oh, how John, did I tell you this? Oh, Anne, let me tell you that, because I need to give power to this gossip, because if I don't keep it going, it's going to die. You see, we keep giving power to stuff, don't we? Uh huh. So there's one power, but when we give its power to other things, like evil, it rises. Drama, gossip, whatever it may be. Those things that are negative. When we give the power, that's when we give. But when we realize that God is one power, we're prepared to see that one power, that's the all good. Wow, the all good happened. The all good unfolded. The all good manifested. How amazing that is. And then we begin to see that God is all-knowing. And we begin to understand that God understands the desires of our heart before we even ask. Already prepared. Because God is all-knowing. So what happens is we have this omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God that we are awakened to. And we become like that student in class when asked uh, in Sunday school, what do you know about God? And he said, oh, 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 that's right. Oh, 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 I know. Oh, omnipresent. Oh, omniscient. Oh, uh, omnipotent. Oh, oh, oh. If we get that. We're prepared to see the oh, oh, oh. Today I saw the omnipresent. Today I saw the omnipotent. Today I saw the all-knowing God. Oh, 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 it was good. Oh, 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 it was great. Oh, 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 we had a great time coming together as the community of God. You see, this is a place where, and we say that every Sunday, but we have to know what we're saying. This is a place where. This is a place where people of like mind come together in Christ consciousness, recognizing, aware, transformed by the awareness, aware of this power, presence, this ever knowing, this understanding of the infinite and the divine. Now, someone said to me, Pastor, that's a lovely little sermon you gave. It's really great. But I say, find sacred space at home. I find sacred space by myself. I find a lot of sacred space in nature. I find sacred space on my vacation. I find sacred space at the mall. I find sacred space there. Do I have to come to church? No, I want to tell you this. You don't have to come to church. You don't have to do anything. I want to tell you that. Sometimes we've grown up in churches and spiritual environments that say, you have to, you have to. I'm going to make you. You know, maybe your parents, maybe your family, maybe it was your tradition. Maybe you had a guilt and shame. You felt like, I got to go to church. I want you to want to go to church, not have to. You know why? Because the scripture says in Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourself. Forsake not the gathering of yourself. Forsake not this. Don't forget to come together. Wait a minute. So. What's the big deal about us coming together? What's so important about that? You know, if I can have sacred space at home without you, why do I need you? Oh, but I do need you. You need me. I need you. You need the person next to you. Because something happens that's so powerful when the sacred space in you meets the sacred space in me. And the sacred space in you touches the sacred space in you. And before you know it, we have ignited something that's just more and more powerful than ever before. This morning, Scott was working with the Celebration Singers, and he said, you know, when we come to that part, I am a promise, I am a possibility, and, you know, I can be anything he wants me to be. I can da-da-da-da, and build and build and build and build, and then I am a promise! Can't you see? You know, he was wanting us to da -da, go soft and build and build and build. Well, that's what happens when we come together. There's this wonderful power. It's really mighty great. It's awfully really good. It gets better and better, and suddenly it's magnificent. And then, wow! The love of you, the love of you, the love in you, the love in you, the God in you, the God in you is all coming together in this room, and we need to experience that. I can't stay home because I need to experience the love of God in you. 
I need to hear you say how divine operation was at work within your life. I need to hear the story of the struggles you went through this past week and how you overcame. I need to hear the story so we can rejoice together, so we can be uplifted together, so we can share in this divine spirit together. We need this experience, and that's why we come together. This is a place where? This is a place where unlimited possibilities are able to, to unfold for our lives when we realize that. That's why I'm passionate that we be clear that every Sunday morning when we start and welcome one another, we're making a declaration. I declare. I pronounce. I proclaim. This is a place where. Amen.